In this video, we're gonna look at everything that you can do on exam day to maximize your UCAT score. Everything that's gonna improve your speed, improve your accuracy, and things that you can do in the exam that are gonna make a big difference on how well you do. One of the main areas that we're gonna focus on is the use of the actual whiteboard and the marker pen that you get. So to give you an idea, this is about the size of the whiteboard that you'll get, so somewhere between A4 and A5. And then it'll be a marker pen with a kind of this sort of level of nib, let's see if I can get that. And the time to be using these tactics that I'm going to tell you about now is in that time immediately before the exam. Yes, read the instructions, but if you've done a few mocks, you should know what the instructions are saying and know the key things to avoid, like don't hit end exam when you want to hit end review just at the end of the sections. All the things that you should know by this stage, so you don't really need to read the section guide because you should be familiar with it. This is the time where actually, if you're quite astute and quite savvy, this is the time to be using these techniques that during that minute, I'm gonna teach you each section what you should do and what you should write down to help you speed along the process. So once the exam started, but the actual action hasn't started because you're in that one minute of reading, this is the time to do these techniques. And we'll go through each of the five sections and the things that I recommend that you should be writing down to improve your score and speed. So let's start with the verbal reasoning, which is the first section that will come up in the exam. And the first thing that I recommend that you write on your board is short, medium, and long. And effectively what that is, is a reminder that you should triage your question. So as you've seen probably in the verbal reasoning whole playlist that I have for how you should manage your tactics, if you check that out there, you can find out exactly what I mean by that. But essentially what you want to do is judge the passages by their length, not by themes. I think that that's pointless. It's more about the techniques within those themes that matter. But length is gonna dictate how you go about it. And remember I said, if it's long, I would just guess, flag and skip. If it's medium, I'd do the targeted read and if it's short, I would just read the entire thing. So really important to be aware of how you triage the questions and how you go about how you tackle them and whether you do tackle them fully. If it's a long one, which means that you're guessing, skipping, flagging, and then coming back at the end, it just means that you have that bit more time to go through it at the end if you've got through all of the other questions. One technique that a student recently asked me about, which I really do not recommend, is to skip through and just pick the questions to start with that you're happy answering. So the true false can't tell is usually the case. Don't do that because it's such a waste of time going through everything just to get past it. And then that's precious time that you could be attempting it if you were doing it off the bat. So rather attempt all the questions and go through them. Skip, obviously, if there are ones that are difficult or too long for you to go through and do it that way. But don't do the opposite, which is skip and then selectively answer questions. More like selectively skip questions if you're not comfortable answering them. So the other key thing that I mentioned earlier is if you are going to skip, make sure you at least guess something beforehand. You can be equally random in how you guess out of the four answers, maybe do A, B, C, D each time and just go through that cycle, or just pick A every time. As long as you are consistently random or consistent with the one that you go for, that will statistically be the same. So by doing that in a set of four questions, especially even more so if it's true, false, can't tell, and you've only got three options, that you can guarantee that from that question set, if you're guessing, and at least putting something, you're going to get 25% right every time. Because there's actually some really interesting data out there about what you can effectively skip and how many questions you can leave without answering either at all or correctly before it really affects your mark. So if you have a look at the table that I've put on the screen now, you can see that you can still skip about eight questions, which is two entire sets out of only 11 that are in the verbal reasoning, and you can still get an 830, assuming that everything else is correct, of course. So we need to make allowances for that, but also you can still skip 12 questions, which is three sets out of the 11, and still get a 750, which for the verbal reasoning, which is statistically by far the lowest scoring section, 750 is a phenomenal score. It's, you'd be doing really well. And if you're the kind of person who's getting a 750, you'll probably be doing much better in the other sections, but 750 is on the way to easily get a 3000 plus score. But then if you look at it more realistically, which is where you're missing marks from about 16 questions, which is four sets out of 11, whether that's a combination of skipping and getting it incorrect, you'll still get about a 680, which again is way above the average for that section. So if we're going on the assumption that anything that you skip and guess is wrong, which actually is probably better than that, and allowing for maybe some mistakes, 
We could, in theory, have about 10 questions that we skip, six that we get wrong, and that would still only make 16 marks missed out of that entire section out of the 44, and that would still get us a 680, which would, again, like I say, be a fantastic score. And as you're going along, you can even tally the questions that you've skipped, so you can kind of tally off the marks that you're missing out. And that's more just to reassure you that when people are skipping, they think, oh my God, I've skipped so many. But actually, when you keep a tally and realize that you've got 10 lives, so to speak, you can be quite reassured and stay calm that you're not doing as badly as you think. We often catastrophize during exams, and this is a very high-pressured, speedy exam. So it's a good method to keep you calm and make you realize, or at least keep track of how many you're attempting and how many you're skipping. The other technique that I'm about to show you is really effective for using the whiteboard in those questions where it's multiple choice, and you're really not quite sure about which the answer is. What happens is when you're going through all four of the answers and you have to be like, yes, no, maybe, you start losing track of which ones you thought it was. So when you come back to the end and you've got two that it's a toss up between, you forget which ones those are. So I wouldn't recommend using this technique that I'm about to show you for every single question, but for the ones where you kind of need to decide a little bit and you're not quite sure and you want to just save time by not having to go back and recheck answers that you weren't sure about. This is a really good technique that I'm about to show you now. So I'll put an example on the screen now of this passage regarding Facebook photo albums. And let's say that I get to question seven and I'm not sure whether it's A, B, C or D. So what I would do is do, so you could write this, these headers at the start of the exam before you start. So do question, then you do, I would say the context. So if we're looking at this question here, the context is about the success of the question. So let me just show you how that would look in a second. So A, B, columns A, B, C, and D. So these are the option answers that you have here. So let's say we get stuck on question seven and we're not sure. And looking on the screen now, you can see that the question is about Facebook's tagging policy can be judged as a success because. So really the context is, success because, why is something a success? So that's just gonna help us, why success? So, so we'd look at A from the passage, is it a success because users have added millions of tags? I'd say that is potentially yes. Now, at this point, actually, for this question, I'd probably move on because I'm, from the first sentence, you can kind of tell that that's the answer. But let's say, hypothetically, we're going through all of this. Is it popular in the US? Well, it says nothing about popularity in the US, so I'd say no. Uh, then it says, that Facebook can change the user's settings. Well, it, they've not said anything in the passage that would make it a reason for the success. So I would say, but let's say that I'm not sure, so uh, I'm not quite sure about that, so I'll come back to that one, so I'll put a question mark. And then, user information is easy to keep private. Well, is that a reason for success? Remember from the context that that's how we're judging it. So maybe we'd say that no. So if we're unsure, we can always come back at the end and say, actually, it's between A and C, and then we just have a bit of an idea whether to, to narrow it down at least, and we're not losing our place. Now, like I say, this is a technique that you don't have to do for every single kind of question, but it can help you with the ones that you're not sure about when you've got a little bit more time at the end to really just go through everything. And then, you know, as you go on, you might have uh, question 12, and it could be about which one refutes which one, and then the question, you know, whatever it is, 19 might be about, sometimes it asks you to prove, and this is where it's good sometimes to put the context because sometimes people often get mistaken between the negatives. So often it's asking you which confirms, which one refutes, which one proves, which one disproves. And sometimes people get mixed up between the two in the heat of the moment, they get caught up on those double negatives. And actually, well, the answer being the double negative, the second bit to that uh, question. And that's when people lose silly marks. The second section that will come up is the decision making. And this is the one where you'll probably use the whiteboard most. And that could be anything from drawing Venn diagrams to putting syllogisms in a visual representation, or even if you get paragraph text, so written data in prose, that's a good way to maybe put it into a table or just a visual representation of that, whether it's graphs or whatever it is, that's gonna help you understand it better so that you can answer the question. This is one to check whether it's a one-off question, which you sometimes have, or a five-part question where actually by drawing it out and investing the time up front, it makes those subsequent answers of that question quicker. So it's knowing whether it's a stem of multiple questions or just a one-off one-mark question, because it's really important to 
know how the marks are awarded for decision making because it does vary depending on whether it's a STEM question with five subsequent questions or just a one-off one. If you want to find out more, I recommend that you check out this video which will tell you everything about how to know how the marks are allocated with the decision making. But that will also come with tinkering and practice and just doing those practice questions yourself. So in the decision making, there are only six types of questions that come up. So in that minute, while you're twiddling your thumbs, you might as well sit down and write them all out so that you can at least mentally prepare for what's about to come. And maybe if there are a couple that you are not so confident with, you might be inclined to skip them a bit more readily if they're one of your areas of weakness and then flag them and come back. And you can check out this decision making playlist here where I talk about the six kind of questions and how to best answer them. And off the bat, you might want to write on the whiteboard, maybe asterisks, the ones that you think that you are more likely to skip if you should want to. So again, you can have a tally of how many skips you're allowed. In this, it's out of 29. So 19 would give you about 700, which means that you can probably skip about five and then assuming that you maybe get five incorrect, then that would give you a 700 score, which is pretty good. Decision making is typically about the middle ground for how well people do generally. So quantitative reasoning and abstract reasoning are the ones that people tend to do well on, verbal reasoning not so well, and decision making is about middle. So you should be aiming to do quite well on this. If you're good at it, try and do minimal skips, but about a 700 is kind of the lower end of where you should be aiming really. So then we move on to the quantitative reasoning. And here I would recommend that you write down things like calculations, equations, conversions, decimals and fractions. So just common things that you can have at the tips of your fingers ready to go that you can refer to. Just important things like that, that if you can remember those conversions and just have them written down for you, it will help you speed up massively. Then you can even have little reminders for yourself. So often the question when you do calculations, you might not have to know the exact value of the calculation, but if you know that it's gonna be an odd number and all of the other options are even, then you can actually just shortcut that very quickly and say, well, I look at these numbers and this has to be odd, so therefore, if there's only one odd option there, that is a very short, a quick shortcut to help you eliminate all that stuff without having to do any calculations. So little reminders to yourself. So odd versus even, things like impossible questions. Every quantitative reasoning has a few what I call impossible questions, and they are there to slow you down and actually see if you waste time on those. Those are the ones that you should guess, flag, skip, and then come back to after, if you've got the time to go through them. But they're there to see if people can just triage and move on and just skip those questions, or whether they'll get stuck and bogged down with it and lose precious time. Quantitative reasoning is historically the highest scoring section. So apart from the impossible questions, I would recommend that you try not to skip much, but equally I'll caveat that with saying that you have to be ruthless with your time. If something is taking too long, and this is something that you should have established in your practice, but really be ruthless with like, I don't know it, I can't get the answer, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna flag and I'm gonna move on. Because otherwise you will get bogged down on the day with doing too many questions that are taking too long and you're missing out on the future questions which are gonna be simple, easy marks to be gained. And like I say, most people do badly in the UCAT because they don't make it through and they run out of time. Remember the statistic that if you get 100% right but only make it through 70% of the exam, that is a lower score than if you only get 80% right but make it through 100% of the exam. That is obviously a difference of 10%. So really something to bear in mind when you're getting bogged down with questions and actually just getting to the end and getting through all the questions obviously as long as you're maintaining a certain level of accuracy is going to be the best surefire way to score well. Now we move on to the abstract reasoning and straight away the first thing that I would do is write down the acronym of all the possible shapes that could come up. So for me that's Spartan IBS. So if you have a look at this playlist here I go through the entire Spartan IBS acronym and how to remember all the possible shape types that can come up and assess them. But have that written on the whiteboard before you start so that if you're struggling with uh, you can't quite get the pattern you don't know what it is then and at least you can just have a quick look down and see if there's any type of pattern that it could be that you may have not thought about. The abstract reasoning is one section where I would be a bit cautious about skipping purely because you get a set of patterns and for that one set of patterns you get five questions or five test shapes which essentially means that if you skip one you skip five whole marks or you are guessing for five whole marks. That said, you still have to be ruthless with your time with this. I would say that typically what you do is allocate 45 seconds to working out the pattern and then the remaining 15 seconds to just ticking A, B or neither for the five test shapes. So 
If you've got to 45 seconds and you haven't answered the question, you're still not sure what's going on, have a quick look down at your whiteboard, see if there's anything. If you can't get it any quicker than that, it's time to just be ruthless, guess, flag, skip, move on. So abstract reasoning is actually one that people usually show the most improvement on. And because of that, actually, it's probably with the second highest scoring section typically. Now, because of that, if you are skipping an entire set, it typically shaves off about 50 points. So I would just really work on your technique. You can check out my playlist here that I talked about. If you click the info, you can see all of the playlists for all of the ways to just improve your scores. But this one for the abstract reasoning is one where you see the most improvement. So just be aware of that and just raise your familiarity with all of the question types so that you can really make sure that you're maximizing this section. And finally, the SJT. Now there are only two things that I would recommend that you write down during this minute. The first is, an acronym that I call EEL, and that stands for Emergency, Empathy, and Limitations. And these are there to remind you that most scenarios are a variation of worrying about the patient and putting them first, worrying about their feelings or upsetting them, or if it's a colleague, those are really important and things that you have to consider. Emergency, is this a scenario where you actually have to have, act quickly? Maybe somebody's doing something that's putting patient's information in danger, or maybe they're actually at risk of physical harm, and you need to act quickly and swiftly to avoid that danger, and that is your number one priority. Or finally, is it a limitations issue? Are you maybe a receptionist in a GP practice, and you're not medical? So you need to understand where the limits of your capabilities are and when you should go and ask for the help of a senior. And then the only other thing for the SJT that I would recommend writing on the whiteboard is all the definitions. So you have your appropriateness ones, so very appropriate. And just remind yourself the context in which you would select that answer. So for appropriate, I'll put some definitions on now. So a very appropriate thing to do is a very positive action that is being taken in the context of the scenario. So just roughly some words to remind you of that. Is it appropriate but not ideal. And you can just have definitions for all of those. And then do the same for your importance definitions. And remember the technique, if you look at this SJT playlist that I talk about where we talk about how to discern between all of those, just I would maybe just draw a little tree diagram to help you remember the techniques that are used. So you wanna know, is it generally good, generally bad? So top two, bottom two, and then within that, is it the first one or the second one, or is it the last one or the second to last? and those will just remind you to go about it that way and just remind you of that technique. So that's everything for how to do well on the day when it comes to your UCAT test. So that's everything that you need to absolutely smash the UCAT on the day. One final thing that I would say that we help a lot of people one-on-one -on -one with the UCAT. We've helped people take their scores from a 2,400 to a 3,000 plus, which really gives you the pick of the litter when it comes to medical schools. So if you would like some one-on-one -on -one help and have me coach you on your way to medical school and with the UCAT, I recommend that you check out this video here where you can find out about how you can apply and see if you can have me help you. Otherwise, we have an entire UCAT playlist here which gives you literally everything that you need to do well and then points you in the direction of some of the best resources that are gonna help you score highly. So thank you for watching. I'll see you over in those videos and really, really best of luck with your UCAT.